This second part of this spreadsheet modeling shows the construction of the efficient frontier. And what we what we did earlier was to show the calculation of the means of the individual securities, standard of variance, standard deviation, coefficients of variation, and importantly, the covariance metrics as well as the correlation metrics. So now we show the calculation, first of all, of the portfolio standard deviation, sigma sub p, and the portfolio mean, mu sub p. Now, Starting out, we're going to show the, cal the uh, calculation of the portfolio variance, which you see right up here. It takes quite a bit of doing. And then afterward, we show the calculation of the mean of the portfolio. Now, but first off, you, the investor, would have to choose your weights, which represent the proportional investments in each of the securities, in this case, in each of these three securities. For example, here, we're going to invest 25% of our funds in the market, 10% in Kellogg's, and the remaining 65% in Home Depot. Down over here, we have an interesting combination. 75% of our money goes into the market, 35% goes into Kellogg's. Well, how so? That's because we're allowing for short sale. Now, for us to execute this, for example, if we have $100 to invest, we would put 75% into the market. Then the remaining 25% would be put into Kellogg's. Additionally, we're going to borrow against Home Depot. In other words, we're going to short sell Home Depot to the tune of 10% of our money, borrowing $10 against it, and taking that $10 and putting it also into Kellogg's, hence this 35% that you see here. So in doing yours and constructing your efficient set, you can allow for short sale if you want to. Just make sure that the sum of all the weights equals 1. So this is my check right here, as you can see. Now to start, let's calculate the variance of the portfolio, assuming these proportional investments. So sitting here, equal, open parenthesis, Looking at this formula right here, it will be the weight for the market squared multiplied by the variance of the market. For that, I go up here and click on the variance, and then I close parenthesis. Make sure that you do not put a hat after the variance, because variance is already squared, so there's no hat to. If you want to put hat to, which is to square, square it, then click on standard deviation, and then put hat to, because the square of the standard deviation is the same thing as the variance. You choose the variance, no need to square. And then plus open parenthesis, the weight for the second security squared multiplied by the variance of the second security. And that's it right here, Kellogg's, close parenthesis. And then if I come down here again, the final variance term, I open parenthesis, it'll be this weight of 65% squared multiplied by the variance of Home Depot and I go up here and I click on this and I close parenthesis. So now I've gotten all my variance inputs. All right, these first three terms. Next I go into covariance and as you can see here 2 is the constant multiplying the weight for security 1 or x in this case multiplied by the weight of security 2 multiplied as you can see here the covariance of the two securities which in this case would be the covariance of the market and Kellogg's. You close parenthesis plus open parenthesis 2 again multiplied if you can look up here the weight for the market times the weight for the third security Home Depot times the covariance between those two which is this right here. All right. So I close parenthesis and then plus finally open parenthesis 2 multiplied by the weight for Kellogg's times the weight for Home Depot times their covariance which is this right here. I close parenthesis and we multiply each covariance term by 2 because there are two occurrences of the covariances within the matrix. That's the mathematical implication. All right now, so we're done. We hit enter, and it's the take off the unit of measure again because this is variance. Just leave it as is, all right, like so.
Now, when you take the square root of it and so call it standard deviation as you do right here, see it right there, then you can impose the units of measure on it. So for the mean, looking at it right here, it's the weighted average of the, in, of the individual sample variances. So it's the weight for security one, in this case the market, multiplied by the mean, which you see right up here. Close parenthesis, plus open parenthesis. You can also see my work up here as well as down here in the men, on the men's cell. So multiply by the weight for Kellogg's times the sample mean of Kellogg's right there. Close parenthesis plus open parenthesis. Going back down here, the weight for Home Depot multiplied by its mean right up here. And then you close parenthesis and we're done. So just hit enter and that's how we get this 2.15 right here. So with that, if you look up here, you have to fix the input cells. If I hit F2, you fix the input cells containing the, ver uh, the uh, means because you don't want them to change as you copy down across the different weight selections. Likewise, for the variance, if I hit F2, you want to fix the cells, make them permanent. The variances, as you can see right here, as well as the covariances as I point them out right here. All right, and then you copy down. So these are the, are the two columns that you plot. You highlight them, go to insert, go to scatter, regardless of the uh, version of Excel you're using, you're looking for scatter, and choose the first one is fine. You don't have to choose the second one, which has a line to it. And that's it, and that's it really. All right, you can get rid of the legend. You don't need the legend click over here at the um, chart title and then you can write attainable set and you can see the typing up here after you're done hit enter and it registers now for the access titles go to layout while you're over clicked on the graph and choose access titles primary horizontal hover your cursor and come down here and the x-axis is the portfolio standard deviation All right, and go back up here to access titles and go go to primary vertical and choose the second one here and this is portfolio mean enter that's it and going down here to my finished product all right. This is the minimum variance portfolio right here because it is the portfolio with the lowest standard deviation. And this portfolio here has the maximum return because it has the highest return. And of course, for good reasons, it, ha it has a, a very high standard deviation down here. Now, a couple of things to note. One is, based on what you've learned, only the portfolios beginning from the minimum variance portfolio and going up to the right in this front, uh, frontier are the efficient portfolios because these portfolios offer us the highest return per, uh, per risk or the lowest risk per return. All right, so for example, look at this portfolio right here. This portfolio here has approximately the same standard deviation as this one right here if you work your way down from there to the x-axis. However, this one here will offer a higher return than this one down here. So no rational investor would want to choose this portfolio over this. In fact, none of these portfolios here is efficient because all of them are dominated by these selections up here, these combinations up there. Now the second thing to note is when you choose your weights, you can choose any old weights that you like and just make sure that the sum of the weights is equal to 1. Now it doesn't matter because that's your choice variable. Now based on your weights, you're going to have your variance and your mean, of course your standard deviation and your mean, and when you plot it, it may not come out looking this pretty. <laughs> Don't worry about that. It can be any old place you know, on this uh, chart. In fact, that's the way it ought to be because what that's telling you is that any of these combinations is attainable. The question is which ones are efficient. You may ask, why do I have this textbook chart here? You know, that's because the weights are incremented 
by the same units. When you do that, then you're going to have something that looks this nice. But again, don't waste your time trying to make sure that your weights are incrementing by the same units. So now, going further, we wrap it up by showing the calculation of the beta of a security. And we do so by running a regression of that security's return against the markets. To do so, you go to Data, Data Analysis, choose go down here and choose regression and OK and if we while my cursor is clicking here next to input Y range my Y which is the dependent variable is of course the stock I'm gonna choose Home Depot for, for just the fun of it alright so choose Home Depot and then my input X range I click here cursor is blinking there would be the markets proxied by S&P 500 alright get it real fast, check labels, output, and then click right here. While cursor is blinking there, let's go down right here, choose a spot on the spreadsheet like somewhere right there. All right, and then click OK. This is the most important thing that you're looking for right there because the coefficient on this regression is your beta estimate and this, this shows uh, based on the data we have the estimated beta for Home Depot is 0.86, slightly less volatile than the market. Remember, the beta of the market is equal to 1. Over here, this is an earlier regression I ran of the returns on Kellogg's against the market. And the beta estimate for Kellogg's is only 0.43. So Kellogg's is even less than half as volatile as the market. It's not a very reactive stock, by the way. I guess because it's a food stock people have to eat in good times and in bad. Now also notice that the p-value corresponding to the t-statistic a measure of the statistical significance of this slope which again is our estimate for of beta is significant. Whenever your p-value is less than 0 0.05 then you're saying that your result is significant at the 5% level and in this case this value is well below 0.05 in fact if you choose to be more conservative testing at the 0 0.01 level which is the 1% level still the result is statistically significant because this p-value is again well below 0 0.01 now other outputs um, here that you may be interested in learning about is one right this figure right here that say Excel calls it multiple R this is actually the correlation coefficient alright the correlation coefficient between I hope I'm typing it correctly between Kellogg and the market so this point four four nine eight if I scroll up here and go to the correlation metrics you see it right there the next one right here is called the R square is the coefficient of determination. The coefficient of determination tells you the proportion of the total variation in the Y variable, in this case, a Kellogg stock return, that has been explained by variations in the market. In other words, this number is telling you that approximately 20% of changes in the performance of Kellogg's is attributed to changes in the stock market at large. So as you can see, it doesn't appear that the stock market has a great impact in the behavior of uh, this stock. Nevertheless, the relationship between this stock and the market is a significant one given the very, given the, the p-value which is less than 0.05 this p-value corresponds to this F statistic the measure of regression relationship so now referencing this beta estimate here and assuming that the risk-free rate is 4.5 percent and that the market is expected to earn 10 percent we can use the security market line to find the equilibrium return of this security to be 6.88 and that's the calculation there now what I did just for the, for the fun of it I said well suppose the historical performance of this stock is expected to continue into the future now going back here and considering the um, the uh, mean return of this stock 1.04% which is a monthly mean return since I use monthly data 
I average I uh, annualized it by multiplying it by 12 which gives me an estimate of the annualized rate of return. So if this annualized rate of return is expected to be earned in the future, then this would indicate that actually this is a very good stock to purchase because it is expected to earn about twice as much as the rate of return that it is required to provide the investor given its beta. So this concludes this presentation. I am Pat Obi, Professor of Finance, Purdue University, Calumet.